greet whenever you guys are ready. And we'll jump into, uh, we'll kind of pick up where we left off last week. We're ready back there? Okay. Hey, just want to say hello to everybody watching my live stream. Thank you guys for joining in. Uh, we are in Ezekiel 36. Um, we've been on a series talking about um, the new covenant and talking about the fact that it is a spirit covenant. It's a covenant of being led by God's spirit. And uh, just been talking about how powerful that is and, and how that operates and how that's effective in our lives. Um, because, you know, you know, under the old covenant, um, there were only three groups of people um, that really had God's spirit. And that was the prophet, the priest, and the king. And uh, they were the ones that, that had God's spirit. They were the ones that spoke for God. And so relationship under the old covenant uh, was based out of you looking at a person. Um, and so they, you know, the prophet would come and speak on God's behalf. And then when we see Moses come in, we see that Moses um, be, became the go-between between between God and man. They had, a, they did not want to have a personal relationship with God. They wanted Moses to have a relationship with God, and then they would have a relationship with Moses. And so um, that's how the old covenant operated. But the new covenant is different. How many know Jesus did not come and die? so that you can have your relationship with God through another person. See, the reality is there's nobody in this room right now that's any better than anybody else. There's nobody in this room right now that's more right with God than anybody else. Um, we've all been invited into a real and dynamic, personal relationship with God. And, um, and so the difference between the old and new is this. There is no longer a middleman between God and man. There's no longer a Moses that is your representative to God or God's representative to you. When Jesus died on the cross and when that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom and the Holy of Holies was opened up, the Spirit of God poured out upon all flesh according to the book of Job. And now there's not just three groups of people that are anointed. How I many know when you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have now become anointed. Amen? You are a Christian. That word Christ means anointed one. And so now you have received the Spirit of God. And not only are you anointed, um, you are now, according to Corinthians, the temple of the living God. How I many know the only reason we're having church today is not because we're in a building, it's because we've gathered together and we brought Him with us when we came. And so now, the Spirit of God, as a born-again believer, is residing on the inside of you, and God's intention is to have the most beautiful, wonderful, freeing relationship with you by His Spirit. And I say this all the time, you hear God for you better than anybody else does. You hear God for you better than anybody else does. Now, <clears throat> as I'm saying that, don't think that I'm trying to do away with the concept of leadership. I'm trying to do away with the concept of pastors and, and leaders and the fivefold ministry gift. I'm not trying to do that. <clears throat> There's no biblical support for doing away with leaders. There are still leaders. There are still pastors. There are still evangelists and all of these offices in the body of Christ. But the primary purpose of leadership is to equip you for the work of the ministry, to equip you to have your own personal relationship with God. The primary job of a leader is to step aside and point to Jesus so that you can have your own relationship with God. And, and if we will take our personal relationship with God and we'll lift it up and give it a place of importance, how I many know oh, that's going to keep some of the horrible things that we've happened in the body of Christ from happening? How I many know oh, that, that people have abused their authority in the church? And they've used people and they've controlled people and they've condemned people and they've made people feel low as though they could not have their own relationship with God. We went through a period of time in the dark ages where people couldn't, regular people couldn't even have Bibles. Only, only a select group had Bibles and they were chained behind the pulpits and they were written in Latin and written in languages that the common people could not have. And um, there was this sense of we're up here and you're down here. We'll tell you how to have a relationship with God. And I'm here to tell you right now, Jesus did not come and die so that you could have this relationship with God through another person. God wants to speak to you personally. God is living on the inside of you, and He wants you to have a personal relationship with Him. Amen? That's the whole purpose of the new covenant, and that's where the Spirit of God comes in. This covenant is a Spirit-led covenant. God wants to lead you by His Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to have leaders. It doesn't mean we're not going to have counsel and people try to help us and people come alongside us and give us wisdom and understanding. But at the end of the day... 
God says, I want, I want to be your God. I want to be your leader. How many know we've had a lot of codependent ministry in the body of Christ? And it can be a very unhealthy thing for both people that are involved. Um, God wants you to have your own relationship. And so the purpose of this new covenant is to provide that. And we see this has been our springboard verse out of the book of Ezekiel. And it's a prophecy concerning what was coming. Ezekiel chapter 36 and in verse 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So God's saying there's coming a time when I'm going to place my spirit inside of you and my spirit is going to cause you to walk in my ways. See, your Christianity is not supposed to be lived in the strength of your own willpower. This thing is not about trying harder and doing more and, and, and you know, trying so hard to walk in love and trying so hard um, to, to, to do what's right. God said, I'm going to put my spirit inside of you and I'm going to give you a desire. I'm going to give you a want to to walk in my ways. And that's one of the primary differences between the old and the, the new. We're going to look at this when we get into Romans chapter 8 later. The law was ineffective because the law placed all of man's strength at the helm of his life. How many know our strength will fail? If you understand uh, your humanity and if you're real and honest about yourself, your strength will fail. And see, you know Jesus, His name, you know what His name means? It means Savior. See, the product of, of this whole thing is this. God says, I made you. You're going to have weakness. You're going to have failure. But I'm going to save you. You have to understand, that's the dynamic of this relationship we have with God. It's not about you being perfect and awesome and flawless and never making mistakes, never failing, and just being this amazing, perfect person. No, God says, I've given you this treasure in an earthen vessel. You're going to fail, you're going to fall, but I am going to be your salvation. I'm going to save you. I'm going to continually rescue you and give you my strength. And the biggest part of this of our Christianity is learning how to surrender and learning how to trust. Not in ourselves, in our own strength, but learning how to trust in Him and His strength. How many know that it's difficult to float in water by straining? We, uh, I always share this example, but um, my, I have two little, I have a niece and a nephew, and they have very different personalities. One is very intense and very hands-on, and very much a go-getter and a doer. And the other one is very laid back. But one kind of deals with some, the go-getter and the doer deals with a little bit of fear. But then the one that's laid back is absolutely fearless, afraid of nothing. And so <laughs> they were both trying to float in the pool, right? And the one, the go-getter and the doer, and the one that has such an intense personality is having a hard time floating. Because he's trying too hard. <laughs> he's trying too hard to do it. He's trying to make it happen. I mean, you can't make it happen. Right? And this other one who's laid back and, and has a different personality just floats with no problem whatsoever. And the difference being, one has an easier time trusting in something else, and the other uh, places their trust within themselves. And so your Christianity is not about you performing or climbing some ladder. Your Christianity is about you surrendering and allowing God to continually save you. And the Spirit that He's placed inside of you will strengthen you and will give you the ability to do the things that He's called you to do. And par primarily what that is, is to love, to be loved, and to love. That's all the commandments, right? And it is done by His Spirit. So... It's a place of rescue, it's a place of surrender, it's a place of trust, it's not a place of striving and performance. And this is what he's talking about. He said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Now how many know we can rely on the strength and the power of the spirit, or we can rely in our own willpower? Yeah. And I've done both. And see, here's the thing, when you're in your own strength and your own willpower, you will feel the pressure of your life upon your shoulders. Because when you're in your own strength and your own, in your own willpower, you are God of your own life at that point. 
And, and God, how many know the Bible says that Jesus' yoke is easy and Jesus' yoke is light? His intention is not for this thing to be really difficult and really hard. His intention is for this thing to be easy. Not saying your life's going to be easy. There's no promises in the Word that says that. You're going to have challenges. This, is a, this, this life is a challenge. But your relationship with God should be easy. And when you're living in that place of trust, the striving and the pressure and the heavy weight of that legalistic performance rises off of your shoulders and you live in a state of childlike trust, even though you don't have everything figured out, even though you don't know how you're going to fix this or how you're going to fix that, but you're trusting in the one that's going to save you, you're floating in His grace rather than flailing in your own ability. You follow me? I mean, you know, there's a difference between the way an eagle soars and a turkey tries to fly. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I mean, when an eagle soars, he relies upon the strength of the wind. He actually doesn't. He just locks himself in, takes the identity that God's given him, and soars. You see him. You see him when the storms come? They love it, man. They just lock in and go. But then you'd see a, a turkey try to fly, or maybe a chicken try to fly. I mean, oh, they flail and flap. A lot of self-effort. Not a lot of progress. And in our Christianity, we can live in the power of the Spirit or we can live in the power of our flesh. Grace will teach you how to allow the Spirit of God to lead you rather than you being the captain of your own salvation. That's the intention. And um, now, there are decisions that we can make that can empower us to walk in the Spirit. And that's where your willpower comes into play. You know, I mean, no no amount of me staring at my phone can make my phone be charged. Can want my phone to charge. You know, one of the one of the challenges in the Johnson house right now is there's a there's a famine of chargers. There's a charger famine. It's rough too, boy. I tell you what, and everybody blames me. Because it's my fault, really. Because what'll happen is if I don't have a charger, I will take a charger and just take it with me, right? Because I do a lot of work and stuff from like a coffee shop. And so everyone assumes that I have all the chargers, right? And, and that's a pretty good assumption. So I'm not, trying to, I'm not even trying to defend myself. And so, so, but when you're in the house and there's one charger and three phones, how I many of oh, it's a rough night? Because you can't charge the phone, right? And, and so we're all, everybody's on 10% and we're all wigged out, you know? It's the American way, right? But how I many know oh, me staring at my phone or me fretting about it or being concerned about it is not going to charge my phone? What do I got to do? I just got to plug it in. And how many know there's a way you can be plugged into God's presence to allow your batteries to get recharged? Amen? And that's key, man. Um, Because the Bible says that we are to be filled with the Spirit. If you look at that word filled, um, it's a continual filling. It's in the present perfect tense. It's a constant. How many know you and I, all of us, we need our batteries recharged? Because see, if, if your batteries aren't recharged and we're not having that fresh flow of the Spirit, that fresh anointing, that fresh encounter with God, I mean, what can happen is we can go back to leaning on the arm of the flesh. We can go back to the flesh's strength. And this, our strength is not a happy place. Because when you're, when you're operating in your strength and you do well, you get prideful and you think you're awesome. And then you actually you forfeit grace in your life. There's only one group of people that God resists and that's the proud. He doesn't really resist anybody else according to Scripture. He only resists the proud. And so when we're operating our own strength and we're doing well, I mean, we can get prideful. And as a result of that, what comes after pride? Fall. Why? Because grace lifts and you're left in your own ability. Or we can get in our own strength and we can get depressed and sad and lonely and feel horrible about ourselves because we fail so much. How I many know oh, God's intention is not for your strength to build a platform of pride for you to stand on? And your strength is also... Uh, not to be a place of depression and sadness because you mess up so much. How many know God's intention is for you to unplug from your ability and to plug into His ability and to live your life according to the strength of the Spirit, which is what Ezekiel's talking about. God says, I'm going to put my Spirit in you. I'm going to cause you to do what's right. I'm going to cause you to make right decisions. I'm going to do it in you. And the primary difference from the Old New Covenant, under the Old, it was all about our strength, what we could do. And how many know that God proved that our strength fails? And that's why the Bible says God found fault with the Old Covenant. It wasn't that there's anything wrong with the Covenant. The challenge was the Covenant was based on our strength. 
And so everybody failed. How I many you know as soon as Moses came down the mountain, all hell broke loose? You know what I'm saying? And then Moses broke the tablets. You know, Moses got mad. And then how I many you know um, nobody kept it? How I many you know David was a man after God's own heart? How I many you know David loved God? How I many you know David failed miserably? The failures are recorded over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New is this, because we are not called to be our own Savior. We need God. Amen? And so, under this new covenant, it's not about what we are doing for God, it's actually about what God is doing for us. God said, I'm going to do this for you, but you're going to have to let me do it. How I many you know it can be humbling to allow somebody to do something for you? It can be humbling to allow someone to give something to you. It can be humbling to, to, uh, to have someone help you. You ever have someone and they're in a really hard position and you know you can help them out of it, but they don't want your help? I wonder how often God spends in that place. <laughs> because there, and that's the beauty of grace. In order to access grace, there's a humbling. I mean, you know, humility is what is the cup that we drink grace with. And what, what it says is this, God, I can't do this, but I know that you can. And see, the sad thing is, is when we get under condemnation and we allow ourselves to get downtrodden because we can't fix this problem, we can't change this, uh, God says, I've never called you to fix or change anything. I've called you to allow me to fix it for you. I mean, the battle is not ours, but the Lord's. Amen. And we learn how to yield. We learn how to submit. We learn how to humble ourselves and trust Him. And then salvation comes. But the challenge is the passage of time. And that's where trust comes in. Amen. And that's where this new covenant, once again, is not about your strength. It's about His strength and it's about His rescue. And so um, we, we looked at in times past and just a little bit of review. We look at all of Jesus' ministry. He pointed to one that was coming. He kept saying, it, it, is, it is expedient for you that I go, because if I don't go, the Comforter is not going to come. Over and over again, we see Jesus. He's always pointing to the one that's coming. Why? Because he knew there was only so much he could do for his disciples until after he died on the cross and the Spirit of God came. Because, I mean, if you look at the disciples, how I many you know during the earthly walk of Jesus, the vast majority of the time, they really did not know what was going on. They thought for sure he was going to take over the Roman Empire. They thought for sure he was going to be a conquering king like David. They thought, and then, and then when he's ready to die, Jesus is ready to rebuke Jesus Christ. Jesus, so I'm going to rebuke you. You're not going to die. And Jesus is like, brother, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Y'all need to wait. Tarry in Jerusalem, wait till the Spirit comes. And then once the Spirit comes, then I'll be able to teach you from the inside out, not just from the outside in. And so Jesus was constantly pointing to the Holy Spirit that was coming. So my Father has a gift that He's going to give you. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's awesome. He's coming. And so then we also found out that when the Spirit of God comes, the Spirit of God only testifies of Jesus. The Spirit of God only honors the finished work. The Spirit of God, that's, that's what He has come to do, is come to honor Jesus and to honor the fact that Jesus had a finished work on the cross. So what does that mean? That means the Spirit of God does not partner with condemnation. The Spirit of God does not honor condemnation. What is condemnation? Condemnation is a declaration that God is angry with you, God is against you, and God is going to hold and punish you for your sins. Okay? Um, God is not going to honor a message that dishonors the cross. And it's so funny because I don't care how much we talk about this, you get to this point and you've got, you got to lay it out afresh and new. How many of y'all think Jesus did a good job on the cross? Do you think He paid for your sin? Do you think He paid for all of your sin? He did, right? Because He actually died 2,000 years ago. He died before you were born. So He paid for your sin, right? He paid for the sin of your children. He paid for the sin of your children's children. Jesus Christ paid for the sin of the entire world on the cross outside of time. All the sin of all of mankind was placed on Jesus and punished and condemned in His body. Right? So all sin's been paid for. Everybody say paid for. Now, even in, in our modern day culture, they have something called double jeopardy. Even in our legal system. How many know that you cannot punish someone for the same crime twice? Right? You can't. It's according to our legal system. Well, it would be double jeopardy for Jesus to take the punishment for sin on the cross and then for you also to be punished. 
What it would be saying is this, is saying that you, that Jesus didn't do a good job, Jesus didn't pay it in full, so now you need to be punished. Jeremiah, are you, are you saying that we should just go out and sin and go out and do dumb stuff? Did I ever say that? No, I'm not saying that. I mean, you know, sin has its own punishment. When you sin, what's going to punish you? Sin is. Because sin brings forth death. Right? But the reality is this. Jesus, He paid for all of your sin. And so now, God's message to the entire world is not a message of condemnation. How I many know now our message is a message of reconciliation? It's a message of goodness. It's a message of love. How I many know God's message to the drug addict? is not a message of I hate you, I'm against you, I'm going to punish you. God's message to the drug addict is this, I love you, you're my child, I'm here to save you and rescue you. Amen. And so the message that we preach is a message of invitation. It's a message of, we, of, of God loves you, God's not mad at you, God is for you. Now, in that statement, it doesn't mean I approve of the drug addict's addiction. I mean, you know, if someone's hooked on cocaine, I'm not saying go do more cocaine. I mean, cocaine destroys people's lives. But, but the invitation is this. Even though you're hooked on cocaine, God's love for you is greater than your sin. God's love for you is greater than the destruction you're in. God will rescue you from what's hurting you or harming you. Amen? And so the message that the Spirit of God honors is the message that honors the work of the cross. How many you know Jesus' blood was greater than the blood of bulls and goats? Interestingly enough, the blood of bulls and goats had the ability to provide forgiveness for a year when, when, when that sacrifice went to the high priest. And, but how many Christians have a hard time believing they're forgiven for a week? Or a day? Let alone a year. Now, if the blood of bulls and goats can provide a yearly forgiveness, how much more do you think that the blood of the Lamb of God can provide an eternal forgiveness? And the reason people have a sense of condemnation in their, in their conscience is from the pulpit, the blood of Jesus is not being honored properly. The work of the cross is not being honored properly. If we're really going to honor the work of the cross, then our message is a message of absolute forgiveness. You've been forgiven. Amen. It's good news, isn't it? It will always be good news. Your, your forgiveness doesn't wear out. Your forgiveness doesn't grow old. You're not uh, less forgiven this morning than you were the moment that you got saved. Because the power of the blood of Jesus is so strong that it has the ability to secure that forgiveness and keep it for you so that your relationship with God is not a relationship of condemnation and failure, but your relationship with God is based on the sure, solid ground of the finished work of the cross. You now have peace with God and you are standing on grace ground. What does that mean? That means that you would have boldness to draw near to the throne of grace to, to obtain help in time of need. It means this, when you mess up, you don't run from God, you run to God. Can I get an amen? This is, the mess, this is what the Spirit of God honors, is the message of the forgiveness of sin. Even when, G, even when, when the very first Gentile, when the very first Gentile got saved, when, when um, uh, Peter uh, went to Cornelius' house and began to share. As soon as Peter began to speak about the forgiveness of sin, that's when the Spirit of God fell. The Spirit of God interrupted Peter's whole sermon, messed his notes up. As soon as he made the, just the flat declaration of the forgiveness of sin, the Spirit of God fell. Why? This is what he honors. When John saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How I many know that is in that, in that moment, during that baptism, that's when the Spirit of God came down like a dove. And God already spoke to John's heart. Who, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, that is the Christ. God said, This is my beloved Son whom I am well pleased. How I many know Jesus is on a, mess, on a mission of salvation, not a mission of condemnation? Now, in the very same breath, how I many people have the ability to reject forgiveness? People have the ability to reject the Son of God. And if they want to, then they're going to have to pay for their own sins. And if you have to pay for your own sins, that's a whole different ballgame than Jesus paying for your sins. Then they'll have to stand up to the law and they'll have to weigh themselves in the balances. Um, so I'm not saying that there is not... Uh, there, our part is to simply believe. But it's all been paid for. But you're only going to enjoy what you believe. And so, then we also looked at the, the work of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness now under the new covenant. He has three, three things that He does. He convicts the world of the sin of unbelief. I mean, you know, that's what causes people not to be saved. Not, not, their, not all of their sin. 
I mean, you know, there's not one sinner that's greater than another sinner. A lot of times we want to think that, and the reason we will think that is we don't understand the law. The law is a composite whole. It's not graved on a curve. If you broke one, you broke them all. And the law came to bring in equality in the sense of guilt. The entire world came, became guilty before God because nobody could keep the law. But a lot of times what people want to do is they want to say, well, because this person is you know, a drug addict, they're a huge sinner. And this person, they're just a glutton. So you know, they're not as bad of a sinner. I mean, you know, that without Jesus, nobody's getting to heaven. So, so, so the reality is the Spirit of God comes to convict the world of the sin of unbelief. Now, once you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, from that point on, the Spirit of God is going to begin to convict you of righteousness. He's going to convict you that you're the righteousness of God. He's going to convince you that you're the righteousness of God. This is the dynamic of the new covenant. Why does he do that, Jeremiah? Because it's this. If you believe right, you will act right. If you believe that you're a good person, you're going to act like a good person. If you believe that you're loved, you're going to act like you're loved. If you believe right then your behavior is going to follow. So the Spirit of God is going to bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God, that you're the righteousness of God, and that you're a good person because God has made you good. Now, we get into error and we get Him to mess up stuff when we start talking about, well, I'm so bad and I'm so this and I'm so that and I do this and I do that. Sweetheart, it's not about you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, be dismissed from weighing yourself in the balance. If we all got up here and weighed, weighed ourselves in the balance this morning, all of us would be found wanting. But see, here's the thing. We didn't come here to talk about you, and we didn't come here to talk about me. We came here to talk about Jesus. Jesus has been weighed in the balances. Jesus has taken your punishment and my punishment, and now Jesus has made you and I forever the righteousness of God in Him. He has given it to you as a gift. Isn't that the best news in the world, right? So don't focus on you, your shortcomings, and your failures. I know it's attractive. I know we think we can somehow fix it by doing that, but we can't. It's like trying to stay in the center of the road by staring at the ditch. If you stare at the ditch, you're going to end up at the ditch. If you stare at your failure and your sin, you're going to end up. No, keep your eyes on Jesus. You acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That's how your faith becomes effectual and effective. I mean, this is about Him, not about us. Amen? And so what happens then, if you take that attitude, and when in your weakness and your failure, as you behold Him, you become so grateful and so thankful that He's your Savior, and you remain the righteousness of God even when you fail, even when your actions aren't perfectly righteous. Because your Savior has saved you to the uttermost. And so your failure actually produces gratitude rather than uh, this sense of self-examination, this sense of, of destitute and depression because you're staring at your failures. Listen, if you're disappointed in yourself, you're not called to focus on yourself. I mean, you know, we can periodically disappoint ourselves. But see, if, you, if, you're, if you're spending your days living disappointed and focused on yourself, you're putting your trust in the wrong things. Put your trust in Jesus. Don't put your trust in yourself. Amen. Because here's the reality. You will let you down. <laughs> Amen. And, and your membership in the family of God is not going to be revoked because you've done something dumb. Can I get an amen? I mean, no one is able to, to, to pull you out of your Father's hands because that's how powerful His salvation is. Amen. And this does not create a lifestyle of licentiousness. This does not create a lifestyle of sin. This actually creates a lifestyle of gratitude and love and thankfulness that, man, I'm saved. I'm in the family. My daddy, he loves me. He's never going to leave me. He sees the best in me. Can I get an amen? amen? I'll take it a step further on this good news note. Not only are your sins and lawless deeds forgiven, which is great news, right? Doesn't it feel good to be forgiven today? You're forgiven. Amen. It's wonderful. But not only that, your sins and lawless deeds, he remembers no more. According to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. What does that mean? That means when God looks at you, He doesn't see your failure and your sin. When God looks at you, He sees, you, he sees a child of God. He sees you in His Son. Amen. Isn't that amazing? So now God's not going to deal with you according to your failure. God's going to deal with you according to His Son's righteousness that's been given to you as a gift. Well, Jeremiah, are you saying that, that God's never going to correct us? No, I'm not saying that at all. A loving father corrects his kids. 
God's going to correct you. If you're going down the wrong path, God's going to lead you down the right path. But He's not going to correct you in condemnation. He's going to correct you in justification and righteousness. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Let me show you the difference. You're going down the wrong path, and then here comes correction out of condemnation. Look at you. You're so bad. You're so dumb. You're so lazy. You're so... I mean, oh, that is an attack against character. That's not godly correction. That's actually demonic. Because what's happening is the blood of Jesus that purged this child is actually on trial and being judged. These accusations, you know, when, when Paul persecuted the church, he told Jesus, he said, why, why are you persecuting me? How many know Jesus now identifies with you just like you identify with him? How many know you're in Christ? Can I get an amen? Is there anything wicked in Christ? Is there anything bad in Christ? Is there anything dirty in Christ? Where are you? means that you're good. Can I get an amen? So when correction comes, it's not going to be an attack against your character. Because if I attack your character, I'm only going to empower you to fail more. If I attack you and say, you're no good and you're bad and you're this and you're awful and you're lazy and you're not spiritual and you're... As I'm doing that, I'm actually downloading failure into this individual. I'm empowering them to live out what they believe about themselves. God does not correct like that. How does God correct? God comes and says, Know ye not that you're the temple of the living God? Don't you know that you're the righteousness of God? All this that you're wrapped in, that's not who you are. You're better than this. Here, let me open your eyes to see my Son so that you can be changed into the same image from glory to glory. Look at my Son. Don't look at your failure. Don't identify with your past. Don't identify with your flesh. Identify with my Son. Arise, you are good because I have made you good. You're the righteousness of God. Your sins and lawless deeds I remember no more. I love you. I paid for your sins. I mean, you know, it's more difficult to rebel against love than it is to rebel against judgment. It's easy to rebel against judgment. Why? You just run and hide. You either run and hide or you get fake and wear a mask to try to please those that are judging you, to convince them that you're okay. But you know what love does? Love disarms you. When you encounter love in your place of failure, it's a bit of an overwhelming experience. Because your heart's filled with gratitude. You're like, you still love me after all I've done and all I've said? you still for me? And God's like, yes, I am. And that's where the light of the gospel shines on the rebellion, burns it away, and we find out there's still a child of God under all of this dirt. There's still a valuable human being under all of this dirt. And God has corrected them out of a false identity. When you get involved in all of that junk and go back to old behavior, that's not who you are. Lying against the truth. That's what he's talking about in Ephesians where he's saying, don't embrace this old behavior and think that's who you are. That's not who you are. So do you see the difference between condemnation correction and godly correction? Godly correction will solidify your identity, love you, take you by the hand, and lead you back to the path of righteousness, wherein there is life and there is no death. Can I get an amen? This is what the Spirit of God does under the new covenant. Convicts us of, of righteousness. And the third thing He does is convict the world, or convict the devil of judgment. I mean, you know, the devil's been judged. Can I get an amen? When you're fighting a battle, it's so important to understand this, when you're fighting a battle of temptation, it's not God against you and the temptation. You have to understand when you're fighting a battle of temptation, it's you and God against the temptation. I mean, the temptation has been judged. The devil has been judged. So when you're fighting a battle of temptation, you're dealing with something, God's still on your team and on your side. And you have to understand that that temptation is trying to arise. It's not born of your nature. It's not born of God. It's born of the enemy. So it's you and God together condemning what's trying to rise against you. I mean, that's a totally different way of looking at things. If I'm involved in temptation, I've made a mistake, and now I think God is against me. I mean, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? No, no, no. God's with you in your failure, and it's you and Him together against the enemy. Because the enemy's been judged. You see the difference there? And Because um, God's faithfulness towards you is never going to change. Now, let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. And uh, we just did you know, a little bit of review here. And now, I want to... Um, I want to just, we're going to teach through this. But um, and I'm going to read this to you as before we get there, just to make sure we're all on the same page. But 
talking about the ministry of the Spirit under the New Covenant is a ministry of righteousness, not a ministry of condemnation. Uh, so you guys turn to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read this to you real quick out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. For if the ministry of death, talking about the law of Moses, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. The ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of righteousness is the same ministry, okay? The law of Moses came and condemned, gave the knowledge of sin, showed us that we needed a Savior, and now that we've received Jesus as Savior, now the ministry of righteousness is now affecting our lives. God's trying to convince you that the blood was enough. God's trying to convince you that the cross was enough. God needs your conscience to not be overladen with guilt and despair. God needs your conscience cleansed so that you'll recognize that you're a child of God, that you've been made right by the blood of Jesus, and God is with you and God is for you. It is out of that mindset it's going to be easier for you to be led by the Spirit. When you're under condemnation a lot of times, it's difficult to see how God truly is. I mean, if you think God's... How many of you guys enjoy being around someone who's angry with you? Nobody, right? Love my wife dearly, and, but when she's mad at me, I know it. I can see it from afar. <laughs> and if she's mad at me, I'm not trying to spend time with her. <laughs> I'm trying to find something else to do. Hallelujah. I need to run an errand. I need to go to the store, right? Because if she's mad at me, I mean, if she's angry with me, fellowship's not really, not saying there's not time to sit down and talk and work through things, because yes, there absolutely is. I'm just talking about sheer desire. No one enjoys being around someone who's mad at them. So now, when you, so what's, what's the devil going to try to do? He's going to try to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, paint the picture to you that God's mad at you. If you think God's mad at you, do you want to be with him? No, you don't. You don't want to spend time with him at all. In fact, you want to, you want to actually try to get away from him or do something else if you think he's mad. And that's why a lot of people spend their time engrossed in entertainment because they feel like they've disappointed God and they feel like God is mad at them. And so they don't want to draw near to God because they feel like he's disappointed he doesn't love them. Folks, that's a lie. It's just not true. God's not mad at you, okay? God loves you. And so when that condemnation comes, it puts a veil over the face of your Father and the way you see God gets distorted. How many of y'all have ever spent time thinking God was mad at you? Or maybe it's not even mad, I say disappointed. How I many know in that place, it's not a place of relationship. It becomes a place of striving and performance where you're trying to get God to like you, or it becomes a place of, I just don't want to be around God. I mean, you know, neither one of those places produce relationship. Both of those places produce a, a false sense of who God is. And the reality is this, we see the face of the Father through the face of the Son. Jesus came at like a shining light, revealing the express image of the Father, and now we can look at the face of Jesus and recognize, how I many you know that God is now for you? Never going to change, okay? Don't allow the enemy, because when condemnation comes, condemnation is going to cause you to see God wrong, and how many of you know condemnation will cause you to see yourself wrong? It'll cause you to think bad about yourself and think you're not good enough and think you're this and think you're that, and you're actually devaluing yourself. How many of you know the blood of Jesus cleansed you? Who are we going to honor? Are we going to honor what I've done wrong, or are we going to honor the work of the cross? It's a decision we got to make, man. We cannot allow the enemy to drag us back into the lonely, false fields of condemnation where we lose a sense of who we are and we lose a sense of who God is. The only thing that keeps us out of that place is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And that's why you got to continually hear the good news. It's the power of God unto salvation because it reminds you of who God is, that He's a loving Father, and it reminds you of who you are, that you are a loved child. You are a loved son. You are a loved daughter. Now, once you die and go to heaven, you won't deal with that anymore. You'll, you'll find out that the countenance of your Father is good towards you. But while you're down here on earth, there is a fight of faith to believe that the cross was enough. It's a primary fight that we face. And so this ministry of condemnation, we're no longer under that. 
We are now under the ministry of righteousness, which is the ministry of the Spirit. So the Spirit of God is on the wavelength of righteousness. That you've been declared the righteousness of God. You ever be traveling and your, your radio kind of start to get off the station and you got to try to find another station? When we get off the wavelength of righteousness, we can start getting st- spiritual static and we can't hear properly. Because see, there's, the enemy's always trying to act like he's God. He's always trying to act... He's always, he's, if you look at Isaiah, the devil's primary desire and plan is, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne into the stars. I will, I will, I will. The enemy's always... Tra- he, how many of you know he wants to be worshipped? If you look at him, he tried to get Jesus to worship him. The devil's always trying to be like God. How many know he's not? But he's always trying to act like he is. And how does he do that? Well, the, you have to understand the nature of the devil is he's an accuser. That's what he does. You look at it in Greek, you look at it in Hebrew, his name means hurler of accusation. The devil wants to accuse you and condemn you in the name of God. Because if he can convince you, how many know our God is not an accuser? I mean, our God is a justifier, our God is a savior. Now, Please understand, God gave the law to reveal sin so that we would recognize that we needed a Savior. Can I get an amen? Don't think I'm, not, I'm, I'm antinomian. I'm not against the law. I'm for the law for what the law did. It showed you that you needed a Savior. How I many know the mirror can show you that you have donut on your face? But the mirror can't cleanse your face. If you're trying to clean your face with a mirror, you're going to be, it's going to be a rough day for you. <laughs> the law cannot cleanse you, but it can show you have a problem. The only one that can cleanse you is Jesus Christ. And so what the enemy tries to do is bring in condemnation to get your frequency off. And so now you start thinking that you're hearing God and really it's not God, it's the enemy. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Well, this is how condemnation works. When con- We're going to get to Romans chapter 8 beginning with there's therefore now no condemnation. Romans chapter 8 lays out the Spirit-led life. But it begins with this reality, no condemnation. Without the reality of no condemnation, we have no Spirit-led life. See, when condemnation comes in, let's say condemnation comes in and you've messed up and you feel like God's against you or disappointed in you or mad at you or ready to punish you for your sin, next thing you know, you get a flat tire. What's the enemy's voice? See, the reason you got that flat tire is because God's mad at you. The reason that unexpected bill came in the mill? God's mad at you. The reason this, the reason that. And so the enemy's always trying to build a case against you. And really, it's building a case against the cross. Saying the cross was not enough. And your fight of faith, your fight of faith is not believing for healing or believing for family salvation or believing for um, any of these things. Your primary fight of faith is believing in Jesus and believing that what He did was enough. Because if you can believe in Jesus and believe that He made you the righteousness of God through the work of the cross... He that knew no sin became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God in Him. As you believe that you are now a child of God and you've been made the righteousness of God, all these things will follow you rather than you chasing these things. And so the enemy is always trying to build a case against your righteousness. Saying, see, no, you're not right with God. God's holding this back from you because of this. Or God's not going to... How many of the Bible says that all the promises in Him are yes and Amen. Everything's a yes. I'm talking about all the promises are a yes to you because Jesus is the one who's made you righteous by, the, by His blood. Can I get an amen? There are no disqualifiers for us any longer in terms of God's promises because Jesus did an excellent job on the cross. And so um, this ministry of the Spirit is a ministry of righteousness, not a ministry of condemnation. So now, let's, let, now let's take a look at Romans and we'll, we'll work our way through here. Um, so it begins, Romans chapter 8, it's talking about the Spirit-led life. This is a beautiful chapter showing us what it looks like to be a Spirit-led Christian. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, how many know that is the best news in the world? What does that mean? That means that, that, that it, notice it says to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? This chapter are for those that have received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Those that have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, they still abide under condemnation. 
They're still there. It's like it's the, it's like in in the days of Noah when the ark was prepared. How I many know only eight people got into the ark? How I many know Noah? The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for many days. How I many know everybody was invited, but only eight people actually got in? Well, judgment was released, but inside that ark, how I many know there was safety? Well, today Jesus is the ark, and the condemnation's already been unleashed when Adam ate the fruit. Condemnation's in the earth; it's everywhere. But Jesus is that place of protection. So there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has now become your ark, your place of safety. And so this is the, the way the Spirit-led life begins. So the, the Spirit of God honors the work of the cross with the declaration of that you've been made the righteousness of God. What does that mean? That means God is not going to hold your sin against you. According to Romans chapter 4, your sins and lawless deeds you remember no more. He will no longer impute sin to you. I mean, no, you can't pay for your sin and Jesus pay for your sin. Can't do both. I'm sorry. You can't. Either He did it all or you do it all. There's no in-betweens. Forgiveness is not um, made in payments. It's not a partial forgiveness. You are either totally forgiven or you're totally not forgiven. Amen. And so, this, so what this means is this is the reality that you're now living in, under. There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. And it goes on to say, if you look at the rest of this verse, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Ah, wait, Jeremiah, there's, there's, there's a contested moment here. This looks like this is conditional. Now, I need you to do something for me. I need you to go home and I need you to study this verse because this last part was not, is not in the original transcript. It's added in. They actually take it from a verse down at the bottom. They take it from the verse where it says, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. They take that from there and they plug it into verse 1. Study it out and look at it. That is not in the original text. Why are you saying that, Jeremiah? Because, and let me lay it out to you, before you when you get a chance, you go home, study it out, and you'll see that it's, if you, it's, it's omitted in the original text. But people, the news was so good, they had a hard time with it, so they wanted to temper it, and so they pulled this from the bottom verse and put it up at the top. Now let me lay it, and I just go look at that and study that for yourself. But let me lay it out to you in a logical sense. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Let's say I never walk according to the flesh, and I only walk according to the Spirit. Right? How many know if I do everything right, and I never sin, and I may never make a mistake, how many know there is no condemnation for me, period? Because I never mess up. Right? So, here's the reality. When do you need this gift of no condemnation? When you mess up. <laughs> if you did not mess up, there'd be no place for any condemnation, period. Are y'all tracking me here? So even the logic of this verse with that, ad that additional add-in that was added in by the translators doesn't make sense. Let's read it again with that mindset. There's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you never mess up, God won't condemn you. Well, duh. <laughs> Are y'all seeing that here? And don't, don't, and don't just receive this based on what I'm telling you. Go, go study it out. Look it, in your, look it in your translators. There's a little asterisk there. What, what do you got? Okay. Amen. And see, it's not in the original. And so if you'll look and you'll actually study it out, even in the King James and the New King James, there'll be a footnote there. They pulled from a scripture lower in the chapter because they felt like the news was too good. We can't tell people there's no condemnation in Christ and, and, and have no add-ins on that because people will just lose their minds. But the reality is this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Why? Because you've been forgiven. Now let me lay it out to you like this. Remember when the woman was caught in the act of adultery? Right? And uh, her accusers were ready to stone her and ready to kill her. And according to the law of Moses, they had a right to do so. Now what did Jesus do in that moment? I mean, oh, Jesus came to her and gave her 
this gift of no condemnation. He says, he comes, there she is, she's caught in the act, everybody's ready to kill her. And Jesus, of course, lays out the law properly and says, you that are without sin, cast the first stone. All of her accusers left because they all had sin except Jesus because he did not. And he said to her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Does anyone accuse you? No, man, Lord. And this is what he says to her. Neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. I mean, you know, Jesus gave her the gift of no condemnation in the midst of her disobedience, in the midst of her failure, in the midst of... Of her sin. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now, do you think her, his declaration of no condemnation, do you think it empowered her to go sin more? Or do you think it made her so grateful and so thankful that her life was spared because she just about died a horrible death of stoning? And he said, look, nobody's going to condemn you when I'm around. I mean, no, Jesus did have the right to condemn her because he was without sin, but he didn't want to because he didn't come to condemn, he came to save. And so he said to her, he gave her, neither do I condemn you. This is the gift that God has given his church. And his statement to all of his children is this, neither do I condemn you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus. The spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so this is the declaration towards you. This is what the gospel declares, what the cross accomplished. Neither do I condemn you. And you know what? That gift of no condemnation is what empowers you to go and sin no more. Because in the place of judgment, you found mercy. In the place of failure, you found grace. This is where the Spirit of God lives and abides and leads and guides, is in the place of no condemnation. So, now, anytime you hear someone talking about Scripture, you better study it out. So study out what I just shared with you about there being an omission according to that. Don't just take my word for it. Go study it out for yourself. Because the bottom line is Scripture. If it's in Scripture, we want to embrace it. If it's not in Scripture, we do not. That's the way I live my life. But the reality is this. This presentation of non, no condemnation, there's, no, there's nothing upon it. There's, there, it is an absolute gift given to the church by the work of the cross. And, so, and this is how the Spirit-led life begins. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So God is fulfilling His promise in the book of Ezekiel that um, He's going to put a new heart inside of you. He's going to place His Spirit inside of you. And you're no longer going to live under the weak and beggarly elements of this life and your own willpower and your own strength trying to uh, keep commandments in order to be justified. God said, now I've saved you. You believe in My Son. And now I've placed My Spirit inside of you. And now through a Spirit empowerment, through a Spirit-led life, I'm going to cause you to walk in love and you are going to uh, far supersede the Ten Commandments by the Spirit of God. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Let, let, let's continue to work through it. It says, in the next one, it says, For the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. Why? Could the law not produce obedience? Because, and we talked about this earlier, the law presupposes upon man's strength. And the way I like to view it, and we've taught on it like this at times uh, in the past, is there's a ladder that you climb, right? The law is me trying to do everything right in order to get to the top and be justified and loved and declared right by God. I mean, you know, me climbing the ladder is my own strength. Every religion on earth is based on this ladder of morality. Islam, um, all, the, all the religions of the world are based on man's strength. Only Jesus Christ is based on God's grace. Because the law says you try hard enough to get good enough to get to the top. Grace says, I meet you at the bottom. <laughs> I take your punishment for you, and then I give you the gift of my righteousness. 
And now you've been made right by the blood of the Lamb. And now the Spirit of God is going to, from the inside out, empower you to do what's right, which is simply to walk in love. So the Ten Commandments can tell you not to commit adultery, but how many know they cannot cause you to love your spouse? How many know God just doesn't want people not committing adultery? God wants people loving their spouse. Amen. That's a good relationship. That's healthy. That's a beautiful thing, right? The Ten Commandments tell you not to steal, but how many of the Ten Commandments can't make you want to give and to be a blessing to other people? Ten Commandments can tell you not to take the Lord's name in vain, but how many know it can't make you want to worship God? And that's why this covenant is better. It's a better, it's a better covenant established on better promises. Why? Because God, by His Spirit in you, is going to cause us to walk in His statutes. So, um, so for what the law could not do, and that it was weak, it was based on man's strength, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now here comes that portion of Scripture that they plugged from the bottom and placed it at the top. This is that portion in context. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, here's the reality. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're no longer in the flesh. You're now in the Spirit. But how many know you have a choice whether you're going to be carnally minded or spiritually minded? And that's where this starts talking about being spirit-led and not spirit-led. If we walk according to the Spirit, how many know we're going to end up fulfilling the law? Yes, we are. Okay, what are you talking about, Jeremiah? If I, by the Spirit, how many know the Spirit is going to empower me to love my wife? Spirit's going to empower me to be faithful to her. Spirit's going to empower me to love her just as much as Jesus loves me. That is supernatural. And only God can do that. The Spirit of God is going to do that. I can't do that in my strength. Okay? There's just no way I can. But, and as the Spirit of God empowers me, and I begin to love her the way Jesus loves me, how I many you know adultery becomes something very far removed from my mind? I'm not even thinking about it. Why? Because the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has empowered me to fulfill the law and go beyond it. How many know that, that as I'm being led by the Spirit of God, how many know the Spirit of God is not going to lead me to steal? You know what I'm saying? I'm not, it's not, the Spirit of God is not going to lead me to steal. In fact, what will happen is the Spirit of God will make me so confident of God's supply that I will become a giver. And I will give because I'm confident that God's my supply. So next thing you know, how many know the law ends up getting fulfilled again? I mean, know that as I am worshiping God and loving God, I'm not going to spend my days taking His name in vain and cursing God and coming against God. I mean, the Spirit, as I am led by the Spirit, the law will be fulfilled and we'll go past the law. We'll go beyond it. Because what happened under the old covenant is this. God commanded man to love, but man couldn't love because man was bankrupt from love. Under the New Testament, God takes His love, puts it into your heart, and allows the love of God to be shed abroad in your heart. So now, we, as we are loved, and as we are letting love flow through us, we are keeping the law by the power of love, not the power of our willpower. Did y'all see the difference? How many of all the laws fulfilled in one word? Love. How many of every commandment is simply kept by loving? How many you know if everybody walked in love, we wouldn't even need rules anymore? We wouldn't need commandments. We would, I mean, that's what I believe heaven's going to be like. In heaven, they're not going to have a list of do's and don'ts. Everybody's going to be so in love with the Father and so in love with Jesus and so loved by Him, we're going to be so full of love that we will not need any rules in heaven because love will reign. And I believe that there can be pockets of that on earth. I believe there can be days of heaven on earth. I believe your marriage can be like that. I believe your house can be like that. I believe that a church can try to be like that. Where there's this place where the love of God is so present that we are by the Spirit of God loving, and then the, 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 the law is, 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 an, is an afterthought. Once again, if I try hard to stay out of the ditch, how many of you know I stay in the ditch? 
If I got up behind the pulpit today and just preached against sin, all I talked about was sin, and all I did was show you sin and tell you how you were a sinner and how you were no good. I mean, the only thing I'm doing is I'm empowering you to focus on sin. You know what you're going to do? You're going to go sin. Because I'm drawing your attention to it. But how many know if I lift up Jesus and draw your attention to Jesus, you'll fall in love with Him, and as a result of that, sin will become less, more of an afterthought rather than being in the forefront of your mind. Y'all seeing the difference there? Like if I tell you, don't think of a black cat. Don't think of a black cat. Stop thinking about a black cat. Don't think of a black cat with a little piece of orange on the top of his ear. I mean, as I'm telling you not to do that, I'm drawing your attention to it. I'm actually empowering you to fail. That's how legalism operates. It brings sin to the forefront and all we talk about sin. How I many know we don't come to church to talk all about sin? We come to church to talk about Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? We're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about what He did. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place and time of correction. There's not a time to, to bring forth correction if someone is resisting the correction of the Spirit of God and they're resisting corre God's correction. And let's say someone in the church is you know, beating somebody else up and they're acting a fool and acting ignorant. I mean, you know, there is a place of correction <coughs> in the church. You see it in, in the early church. But it's not the rule of the day. It's actually a lesser thing. Because usually, if you'll just preach the gospel, the Spirit of God will take care of all the correction that needs to be taken care of. And so, it says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, this is where the ball gets in your court, in my court. How I many you know you have a decision on what you set your mind on? And there are things we can set our mind on that don't empower us. We have things we... Now here's the, beauty, here's the beauty of grace. All things are lawful to you. Okay? God's not going to take your identity away based on what type of movie you watch. Can you get an amen? God's not going to take your identity away based on how much sports you watch. God's not going to remove His Spirit from you. But, the reality is this. If I set my mind on carnal things and the things of this world... I mean, you know, it's going to be more of a challenge for me to be spirit-led. It's going to be easier for me to be carnally led. You know, if I spend all of my... And I'm not... Please understand, I'm not standing up here behind this pulpit preaching my convictions. I don't do that, okay? You, the Spirit of God will lead you what you need to do. Amen? The Spirit of God will show you what your liberty is and what your freedom is. But, I will, but I'll say this. Like, I had a period of my life where, man, I listened to so much news... I'm not anti-news, I'm not anti-being informed, but I listened to so much news that I got so freaked out that I started living in fear. Started wigging out and locking my door over and over and over and over and over again and just lived freaked out. And I became almost addicted to world events because I'm trying to manage the fear of the world with my small mind. And so, now here's the thing. Does God love me? Am I a child of God? Yes. Am I setting my mind on something that's not healthy for me? Yes. And I had to draw back on it because it was impacting the way I lived my life. And it was causing me to live in fear. Folks, 365 times in the Bible, God commands you, fear not. The spirit of this world, spirit of fear, wants you to live freaked out and frustrated and afraid. And so, how many know I've got a choice to make? What, what was happening was, I was setting my mind on the things of the flesh and it was causing me to be carnally minded and rather than allowing love to drive fear out of me and me living at peace, <clears throat> I was living in fear. I mean, I'm still going to heaven. Amen? I mean, I'm still the righteousness of God. But how many know that my walk is being frustrated because of what I'm setting my mind on? And so, let's look at it. This is where the ball gets in your court. How many of y'all want to be spirit-led? I do, man. I have to. I need it. I can't, I'm not smart enough <laughs> to navigate this world. I need God to show me and tell me what to do. Period. I just need Him. And so, but there are decisions that we can make that can impact that. It says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. How I many know we have a choice on what we feed on? Like you guys made a decision to come to church today. How I many know today that you're setting your mind on the things of the Spirit? You're setting your mind on heavenly things. That's good for you. That's healthy for you. But how I many know this is just one moment of time in a big, big week? 
and you have a decision to make, you know, I mean, no, there are things that you can do through the week that's going to help you to be more spirit-led. And, and, and we're, we're not going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about what it looks like to be continually filled with the Spirit. There are things that you and I can do to give place to the, to the Spirit of God in our lives so that we can be filled with the Spirit, so we can be sensitive to the Spirit, so that we can be led by the Spirit. And there are things that we can do to cause us to be dull. You know? And this is where your liberty is a beautiful thing, but don't allow the enemy to use your liberty against you and turn you into a carnally minded Christian who's not spirit led. Please understand how many of you know there's no condemnation in that statement? How many of you know there's the righteousness of God? <laughs> Amen. But there is a decision unto life, and there's a decision not unto, and that's what this is talking about. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, so he's talking about being carnally minded or spiritually. I mean, we're closing here. It says, so then, the, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, how I many know that's not talking about you? You're not in the flesh. You've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Y'all see that? But how many know you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, but how many know we, we can walk according to the flesh? And we can walk according to the Spirit. That's your choice. <coughs> Amen. And that involves the decision-making processes that we make. But you are not in the flesh. You are now in the Spirit because you've been born again. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. For if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, how many know if we live our lives carnally minded and consistently make carnally decisions, it's going to bring death? What is carnality? It's, 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 it's uh, anger and wrath and lust, lying, cheating, um, just all that stuff that's involved in the person that you used to be, how I many know if you give place to that and take on that false identity and become to be allow your flesh to lead you, how I many know it will produce death? It'll produce death to your relationships. It'll produce death to your finances. So, you know, you're born again. You're the righteousness of God. But how I many know there's still that carnal mind that tries to arise? That old person still tries to rise. Flesh less against the spirit. Spirit less against the flesh. That's not who you are, but that's who you used to be. How many of your mind still remembers all the stuff you used to do? And when we get over into the carnal mind, we start reacting out of a carnal fleshly place, and that's not life and health for us. And the enemy uh, wants us to go back to that carnal mind, wants us to go back to that flesh so that, you know, it's going to make our lives miserable, make the lives of those around us miserable, and also have impact in our witness. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be different. Amen. We're not supposed to look like the world. Now, it has nothing at all to do with what you, the way you look outwardly. It's not your clothes or your hair or none of that stuff. I mean, you know, the character of our God is love and peace and joy and kindness and gentleness. I mean, you know, these are the things that witness to the Christ that's in you. Amen. And so when that carnal mind tries to arise, it can really mess up things in your life. I mean, no, we don't want that. We want to we lead a spirit-led life. Now, please understand this. When you do get over into the carnal, when you do make mistakes, listen to me. I mean, no, there's therefore now no condemnation. See, you're not going to get out of carnality by being angry with yourself. The Bible says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So when you mess up, how I many know oh, it's time to embrace Jesus? Can I get an amen? It's time to wrap your arms around Him, be thankful, receive that gift of righteousness, the reality of it, a fresh and anew. Get, us, get your feet on the reality of who you are. So don't allow the enemy to bring in condemnation as the Scripture brings in correction into our lives. And that's, and that's what it's talking about here. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. This is what we want right here. The end of this chapter. Led by 
the Spirit. Now, so, and we're closing right here, the Spirit of God will empower you and me to put to death the deeds of the body. What does that mean? That means that when temptation arises, when anger arises, uh, when, when all of the fleshly stuff arises, the Spirit of God will empower you to put to death that bad deed so that it's not outwardly displayed in your life, but it's inwardly taken care of by the Spirit of God. And this comes right down to what we're going to look at next week, being continually filled with the Spirit. You ever had a time where you have been just drenched in the presence of God? Okay, now, when you've had a time when you're drenched in the presence of God, how many know that, that when you're experiencing that, and you're experiencing that, that presence, how many know when the enemy tries to come and bring temptation, it don't even mess with you? How many know when the anger tries to come, it don't even mess with you? When sin comes knocking, it don't even mess with you. Why? Because you are so full with the Spirit, you have no desire to do the things of the flesh. Y'all tracking me here? And this is where the Spirit becomes an empowerment to set you free from the things of the flesh. The Spirit of God will put to death the deeds of the flesh. And this is your everyday life, everyday decision-making processes. Because, I mean, you know, we want a Spirit-led life. We want a Spirit-empowered life. And we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it, what it, what it means to be filled afresh and anew. We're going to look at it in Ephesians. And, and I'll just touch on a couple things real quick. I mean, you know, worship is one of the biggest ways to get filled with the Spirit afresh and anew. You get into a place of worship. You allow the Spirit of God to come in. You, you get your priorities right. You lift up God and let your problems be made low and made small. There's a place of prayer. There's, there's different things that we can do, but it's us getting plugged in, charging our batteries so that we're living life according to the strength of God's Spirit, not the weak strength of our willpower. Because how many know if you're in the carnal mind, it's real hard not to do dumb stuff. Your natural tendency is to do dumb stuff. And so what we don't want to do is we don't want us in the carnal mind trying to live according to our willpower. I mean, you're going to be really frustrated. The enemy will say, look, you're not even saved. <laughs> look, God doesn't even love you. God's not even for you. The enemy will heap condemnation on you um, in that place of the carnal mind. And so as God begins to lead us and guide us and bring forth the Spirit-led life in our lives, Remember what the banner is over the whole thing. No condemnation. Can I get an amen? So no condemnation when you mess up. No condemnation. Now, how I many know you need to apologize who you need to apologize to? Can I get an amen? You need to say you're sorry. You need to restore and all of that. But the bottom line is, as far as heaven's concerned, you've been forgiven. And God's going to teach us how to have a Spirit-led life. Because you're not really mature. That word... Um, they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God is the word weos, and it literally means a mature child. See, and that's one of the challenging things about legalism. Legalism doesn't produce maturity. Under legalism, you're being babysat. And you don't have your own relationship with God. And, and what God wants is for you to have your own relationship so that you're accountable to the Spirit of God within you, not to a pastor, not to an organization, not to condemnation or the fear of punishment, your accountability comes to the Spirit of God that's residing on the inside of you. That's where real maturity begins to happen. And that's where the Spirit-led life happens. So, amen. Awesome. So we're done.